Introduction, the first epistle of Clement to the Corinthians. Clement was a disciple of Peter, and afterwards Bishop of Rome. Clemens Alexandrinus calls him an apostle. Jerome says he was an apostolical man, and Rufinus, that he was almost an apostle. Eusebius calls this the wonderful epistle of Saint Clement, and says that it was publicly read in the assemblies of the primitive church. It is included in one of the ancient collections of the canon scripture. Clement was a first-century leader in the Church of Rome, long before he was appointed its senior bishop. Eusebius recorded that, Clement of Rome wrote in the name of the Church of the Romans. Eusebius did not say Clement wrote as the head bishop of Rome. The Apostle Peter had ordained Linus, Cletus, and Clement as overseers of the Church of God at Rome. Linus succeeded Peter in 67 AD, so Clement would have been acting as an assistant bishop long before he became the leading bishop of the city of Rome in the later portion of the first century. 1 Clement, chapter 41. 1-3, indicates that Clement's first epistle was written before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Quote, Not in every place. My brethren are the daily sacrifices offered or the free will offerings, or the sin offerings and trespass offerings, but only in Jerusalem, and there also the offering is not made in every place, but before the shrine, at the altar, and the offering is first inspected by the high priest and the ministers already mentioned. Those therefore who do contrary to that which is agreeable to his will suffer the penalty of death. End of quote. Scholars who hold that first Clement was written before 70 A.D. cite Clement's frequent quotes from the Gospel of Matthew as proof for a pre-70 A.D. composition of the Gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 1. The Church of God which sojourns at Rome, to the Church of God sojourning at Corinth, to those who are called and sanctified by the will of God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace, from Almighty God, through Jesus Christ, be multiplied. Owing, dear brethren, to the sudden and successive calamitous events which have happened to ourselves, we feel that we have been somewhat tardy in turning our attention to the points respecting which you consulted us, and especially to that shameful and detestable sedition, utterly abhorrent to the elect of God which a few rash and self-confident persons have kindled to such a pitch of frenzy that your venerable and illustrious name, worthy to be universally loved, has suffered grievous injury. For who ever dwelt even for a short time among you and did not find your faith to be as fruitful of virtue as it was firmly established? Who did not admire the sobriety and moderation of your godliness in Christ? who did not proclaim the magnificence of your habitual hospitality, and who did not rejoice over your perfect and well-grounded knowledge. For you did all things without respect of persons, and walked in the commandments of God, being obedient to those who had rule over you, and giving all fitting honor to the presbyters among you. You enjoined young men to be of a sober and serious mind, you instructed your wives to do all things with a blameless, becoming, and pure conscience, loving their husbands as in duty bound. And you taught them that living in the rule of obedience, they should manage their household affairs becomingly, and be in every respect marked by discretion. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 Moreover, you were all distinguished by humility, and were in no respect puffed up with pride, but yielded obedience rather than extorted it, and were more willing to give than to receive. Content with the provision which God had made for you, and carefully attending to his words, you were inwardly filled with his doctrine, and his sufferings were before your eyes. Thus a profound and abundant peace was given to you all, and you had an insatiable desire for doing good, while a full outpouring of the Holy Spirit was upon you all full of holy designs and with true earnestness of mind and godly confidence, you stretched forth your hands to God Almighty, beseeching him to be merciful to you, if you had been guilty of any involuntary transgression. Day and night you were anxious for the whole brotherhood that the number of God's elect might be saved, with mercy and a good conscience. You were sincere and uncorrupted and forgetful of injuries between one another 
Every kind of faction and schism was abominable in your sight. You mourned over the transgressions of your neighbors. Their deficiencies you deemed your own. You never grudged any act of kindness, being ready to every good work. Adorned by a thoroughly virtuous and religious life, you did all things in the fear of God. The commandments and ordinances of the Lord were written upon the tablets of your hearts. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 Every kind of honor and happiness was bestowed upon you, and then was fulfilled that which is written, My beloved ate and drank, and was enlarged and became fat and kicked. Hence flowed emulation and envy, strife and sedition, persecution and disorder, war and captivity. So the worthless rose up against the honored, those of no reputation against such as were renowned, the foolish against the wise, the young against those advanced in years. For this reason, righteousness and peace are now far departed from you, inasmuch as every one abandons the fear of God and is become blind in his faith, neither walks in the ordinances of his appointment, nor acts apart becoming a Christian, but walks after his own wicked lusts, resuming the practice of an unrighteous and ungodly envy, by which death itself entered into the world. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 For thus it is written, And it came to pass after certain days that Cain brought of the fruits of the earth a sacrifice to God, and Abel also brought of the firstlings of his sheep, and of the fat thereof. And God had respect to Abel and to his offerings, but Cain and his sacrifices he did not regard. And Cain was deeply grieved, and his countenance fell. And God said to Cain, Why are you grieved, and why is your countenance fallen? If you offer rightly, but do not divide rightly, have you not sinned? Be at peace. Your offering returns to yourself, and you shall again possess it. And Cain said to Abel his brother, Let us go into the field. And it came to pass while they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. You see, brethren, how envy and jealousy led to the murder of a brother. Through envy also our father Jacob fled from the face of Esau his brother. Envy made Joseph be persecuted unto death and to come into bondage. Envy compelled Moses to flee from the face of Pharaoh king of Egypt when he heard these words from his fellow countryman, Who made you a judge or a ruler over us? Will you kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? On account of envy, Aaron and Miriam had to make their home outside of the camp. Envy brought down Dathan and Abiram alive to Hades through the sedition which they excited against God's servant Moses. Through envy, David underwent the hatred not only of foreigners, but was also persecuted by Saul, king of Israel. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5. But not to dwell upon ancient examples, let us come to the most recent spiritual heroes. Let us take the noble examples furnished in our own generation. Through envy and jealousy, the greatest and most righteous pillars of the church have been persecuted and put to death. Let us set before our eyes the illustrious apostles. Peter, through unrighteous envy, endured not one or two, but numerous labors, and when he had finally suffered martyrdom, departed to the place of glory due to him. Owing to envy, Paul also obtained the reward of patient endurance, after being seven times thrown into captivity, compelled to flee and stoned. After preaching both in the east and west, he gained the illustrious reputation due to his faith, having taught righteousness to the whole world, and come to the extreme limit of the west, and suffered martyrdom under the prefects. Thus was he removed from the world, and went into the holy place, having proved himself a striking example of patience. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 To these men who spent their lives in the practice of holiness, there is to be added a great multitude of the elect, who having through envy endured many indignities and tortures, furnished us with a most excellent example. Through envy those women, the Danaids and Dersi, being persecuted after they had suffered terrible and unspeakable torments, finished the course of their faith with steadfastness, and though weak in body, 
received a noble reward. Envy has alienated wives from their husbands, and changed that saying of our father Adam, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. Envy and strife have overthrown great cities, and rooted up mighty nations. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 These things, beloved, we write to you, not merely to admonish you of your duty, but also to remind ourselves. For we are struggling in the same arena, and the same conflict is assigned to both of us. So let us give up vain and fruitless cares, and approach to the glorious and venerable rule of our holy calling. Let us attend to what is good, pleasing, and acceptable in the sight of him who formed us. Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ, and see how precious that blood is to God which, having been shed for our salvation, has set the grace of repentance before the whole world. Let us turn to every age that is past, and learn that from generation to generation the Lord has granted a place of repentance to all who would be converted to him. Noah preached repentance, and as many as listened to him were saved. Jonah proclaimed destruction to the Ninevites, but they, repenting of their sins, propitiated God by prayer and obtained salvation although they were aliens to the covenant of God. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 The ministers of the grace of God have, by the Holy Spirit, spoken of repentance, and the Lord of all things has himself declared with an oath regarding it. As I live, says the Lord, I desire not the death of the sinner, but rather his repentance. Adding, moreover, this gracious declaration, Repent, O house of Israel, of your iniquity, Say to the children of my people, Though your sins reach from heaven to earth, and though they be redder than scarlet, and blacker than sackcloth, if you turn to me with your whole heart, and say, Father, I will listen to you, as to a holy people. And in another place he says, Wash and become clean, put away the wickedness of your souls from before my eyes. Cease from your evil ways, and learn to do well. Seek out judgment, deliver the oppressed, Judge the fatherless, and see that justice is done to the widow. And come, and let us reason together. He declares, Though your sins be like crimson, I will make them white as snow. Though they be like scarlet, I will whiten them like wool. And if you are willing and obey me, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and will not listen to me, the sword shall devour you. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken these things. Desiring, therefore, that all his beloved should be partakers of repentance, he has, by his almighty will, established these declarations. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 So let us yield obedience to his excellent and glorious will, and imploring his mercy and loving kindness, while we forsake all fruitless labors and strife and envy, which leads to death. Let us turn and have recourse to his compassions, let us steadfastly contemplate those who have perfectly ministered to his excellent glory. Let us take, for instance, Enoch, who, being found righteous in obedience, was translated, and death was never known to happen to him. Noah, being found faithful, preached regeneration to the world through his ministry, and the Lord saved by him the animals which, with one accord, entered into the ark. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 Abraham, called the friend, was found faithful inasmuch as he obeyed the words of God. He, in the exercise of obedience, went out from his own country, and from his kindred, and from his father's house, in order that by forsaking a small territory, and a weak family, and an insignificant house, he might inherit the promises of God. For God said to him, Leave your country and your kindred and your father's house and go into the land which I shall show you. And I will make you a great nation and will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be blessed. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And again on his departing from Lot, God said to him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you now are, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the lands which you see, to you will I give it, and to your seed forever. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, 
so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be numbered. And again the scripture says, God brought forth Abram, and said to him, Look up now to heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them, so shall your seed be. And Abram believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. On account of his faith and hospitality, a son was given him in his old age, and in the exercise of obedience he offered him as a sacrifice to God on one of the mountains which he showed him. Chapter 11 On account of his hospitality and godliness, Lot was saved out of Sodom when all the country around him was punished by means of fire and brimstone, the Lord thus making it manifest that he does not forsake those who hope in him, but gives up those who depart from him to punishment and torture. For Lot's wife who went forth with him, being of a different mind from himself, and not continuing in agreement with him, as to the command which had been given them, was made an example of, so as to be a pillar of salt to this day. This was done that all might know that those who are of a double mind, and who distrust the power of God, bring down judgment on themselves, and become a sign to all succeeding generations. End of chapter 11. Chapter 12. On account of her faith and hospitality, Rahab the harlot was saved, for when spies were sent by Joshua the son of Nun to Jericho, the king of the country ascertained that they had come to spy out their land, and sent men to seize them, in order that when taken they might be put to death. But the hospitable Rahab received them, and hid them on the roof of her house under some stalks of flax. And when the men sent by the king arrived and said, There came men to you who are to spy out our land, bring them forth, for so the king commands. She answered them, The two men whom you seek came to me, but quickly departed again, and are gone, thus not discovering the spies to them. Then she said to the men, I know assuredly that the Lord your God has given you this city, for the fear and dread of you have fallen on its inhabitants. When therefore you shall have taken it, keep me in the house of my father in safety. And they said to her, It shall be as you have spoken to us. As soon, therefore, as you know that we are at hand, you shall gather all your family under your roof, and they shall be preserved. But any one found outside of your dwelling shall perish. Moreover, they gave her a sign to this effect, that she should hang forth from her house a scarlet thread, and thus they made it manifest that redemption should flow through the blood of the Lord to all those who believe and hope in God. You see, beloved, that there was not only faith, but prophecy in this woman. End of chapter 12. Chapter 13. Let us therefore, brethren, be of humble mind, laying aside all haughtiness and pride and foolishness and angry feelings, and let us act according to that which is written. For the Holy Spirit says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, neither let the rich man story in his riches, but let him that glories glory in the Lord, in diligently seeking him, and doing judgment and righteousness, being especially mindful of the words of the Lord Jesus, which he spoke, teaching us meekness and long suffering. For thus he spoke, Be merciful, that you may obtain mercy. Forgive, that it may be forgiven to you. As you do, so shall it be done to you. As you judge, so shall you be judged. As you are kind, so shall kindness be shown to you. With what measure you measure, with the same it shall be measured to you. By this precept and by these rules, let us establish ourselves, that we walk with all humility, in obedience to his holy words. For the holy word says, On whom shall I look, but on him that is meek and peaceable, and who trembles at my words? End of chapter 13. Chapter 14. It is right and holy, therefore, men and brethren, to obey God rather than to follow those who, through pride and sedition, have become the leaders of a detestable emulation. For we shall incur no slight injury, but rather great danger, if we rashly yield ourselves to the inclinations of men who aim at exciting strife and tumults, so as to draw us away from what is good. Let us be kind one to another after the pattern of the tender mercy and benignity of our Creator. 
for it is written, The kind-hearted shall inhabit the land, and the guiltless shall be left upon it, but the transgressors shall be destroyed from off the face of it. And again the scripture says, I saw the ungodly highly exalted and lifted up like the cedars of Lebanon. I passed by, and behold, he was not, and I diligently sought his place and could not find it. Preserve innocence, and look on equity, for there shall be a remnant to the peaceful man. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 Let us cleave, therefore, to those who cultivate peace with godliness, and not to those who hypocritically profess to desire it. For the scripture says in a certain place, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And again, they bless with their mouth, but curse with their heart. And again it says, They loved him with their mouth, and lied to him with their tongue. But their heart was not right with him, neither were they faithful in his covenant. Let the deceitful lips become silent, and let the Lord destroy all the lying lips, and the boastful tongue of those who have said, Let us magnify our tongue, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, and for the sighing of the needy, will I now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in safety. I will deal confidently with him. End of chapter 15. Chapter 16. For Christ is of those who are humble-minded, and not of those who exalt themselves over his flock. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the scepter of the majesty of God, did not come in the pomp of pride or arrogance, although he might have done so, but in a lowly condition, as the Holy Spirit had declared regarding him. For he says, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? We have declared our message in his presence. He is, as it were, a child, and like a root in thirsty ground. He has no form nor glory, yea, we saw him, and he had no form nor comeliness. But his form was without eminence, yea, deficient in comparison with the ordinary form of men. He is a man exposed to stripes and suffering, and acquainted with the endurance of grief, for his countenance was turned away. He was despised and not esteemed. He bears our iniquities, and is in sorrow for our sakes. Yet we suppose that, on his own account, he was exposed to labor and stripes and affliction, but he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, every man has wandered in his own way. And the Lord has delivered him up for our sins, while he in the midst of his sufferings opens not his mouth. He was brought as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. For the transgressions of my people was he brought down to death. And I will give the wicked for his sepulchre, and the rich for his death, because he did no iniquity, nor was guile found in his mouth. And the Lord is pleased to purify him by stripes." If you make an offering for sin, your soul shall see a long-lived seed. And the Lord is pleased to relieve him of the affliction of his soul, to show him light, and to form him with understanding, to justify the just one who ministers well to many, and he himself shall carry their sins. On this account he shall inherit many, and shall divide the spoil of the strong, because his soul was delivered to death and he was reckoned among the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and for their sins was he delivered. And again he says, I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All who see me have derided me. They have spoken with their lips. They have wagged their head, saying, He hoped in God. Let him deliver him. Let him save him, since he delights in him. You see, beloved, what is the example which has been given us? For if the Lord thus humbled himself, what shall we do who have through him come under the yoke of his grace? End of chapter 16. Chapter 17. 
Let us be imitators also of those who in goat skins and sheep skins went about proclaiming the coming of Christ. I mean, Elijah, Elisha, and Ezekiel among the prophets, with those others to whom a like testimony is borne in Scripture. Abraham was specially honored and was called the friend of God. Yet he earnestly regarding the glory of God humbly declared, I am but dust and ashes. Moreover, it is thus written of Job, Job was a righteous man and blameless, truthful, God-fearing, and one that kept himself from all evil. But bringing an accusation against himself, he said, No man is free from defilement, even if his life be but of one day. Moses was called faithful in all God's house, and through his instrumentality God punished Egypt with plagues and tortures. Yet he, though thus greatly honored, did not adopt lofty language, but said, when the divine oracle came to him out of the bush, Who am I that you send me? I am a man of a feeble voice and a slow tongue. And again he said, I am but as the smoke of a pot. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 But what shall we say concerning David, to whom such testimony was born, and of whom God said, I have found a man after my own heart, David the son of Jesse, and in everlasting mercy have I anointed him. Yet this very man says to God, Have mercy on me, O Lord, according to your great mercy, and according to the multitude of your compassions. Blot out my transgression. Wash me still more from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my iniquity, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done that which was evil in your sight that you may be justified in your sayings, and may overcome when you are judged. For behold, I was conceived in transgressions, and in my sins did my mother conceive me. For behold, you have loved truth, the secret and hidden things of wisdom have you shown me. You shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. You shall wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. You shall make me to hear joy and gladness. My bones which have been humbled, shall exalt. Turn away your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and establish me by your governing spirit. I will teach transgressors your ways, and the ungodly shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. O God, the God of my salvation, my tongue shall exult in your righteousness. O Lord, you shall open my mouth, and my lips shall show forth your praise. For if you had desired sacrifice, I would have given it. You will not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a bruised spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. God will not despise. End of chapter 18. Chapter 19 Thus the humility and godly submission of so great and illustrious men have rendered not only us, but also all the generations before us, better, even as many as have received his oracles in fear and truth. So having so many great and glorious examples set before us, let us turn again to the practice of that peace, which from the beginning was the mark set before us, and let us look steadfastly to the Father and Creator of the universe, and cleave to his mighty and surpassingly great gifts and benefactions of peace. Let us contemplate him with our understanding, and look with the eyes of our soul to his long-suffering will. Let us reflect how free from wrath he is towards all his creation. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 the heavens revolving under his government are subject to him in peace. Day and night run the course appointed by him, and no way hindering each other. The sun and moon, with the companies of the stars, roll on in harmony according to his command, within their prescribed limits, and without any deviation. The fruitful earth, according to his will, brings forth food in abundance at the proper seasons for man and beast and all the living beings upon it never hesitating nor changing any of the ordinances which he has fixed. 
the unsearchable places of abysses, and the indescribable arrangements of the lower world are restrained by the same laws. The vast, unmeasurable sea, gathered together by his working into various basins, never passes beyond the bounds placed around it, but does as he has commanded. For he said, Thus far shall you come, and your waves shall be broken within you. The ocean, impassable to man, and the worlds beyond it, are regulated by the same enactments of the Lord. The seasons of spring, summer, autumn, and winter peacefully give place to one another. The winds in their several quarters fulfill, at the proper time, their service without hindrance. The ever-flowing fountains, formed both for enjoyment and health, furnish without fail their breasts for the life of men. The very smallest of living beings meet together in peace and concord. All these the great Creator and Lord of all has appointed to exist in peace and harmony, while he does good to all, but most abundantly to us who have fled for refuge to his compassions through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory and majesty for ever and ever. Amen. Chapter 21 Take heed, beloved, lest his many kindnesses lead to the condemnation of us all. For thus it must be, unless we walk worthy of him, and with one mind do those things which are good and well-pleasing in his sight. For the scripture says in a certain place, The Spirit of the Lord is a candle searching the secret parts of the belly. Let us reflect how near he is, and that none of the thoughts or reasonings in which we engage are hid from him. It is right, therefore, that we should not leave the post which his will has assigned us. Let us rather offend those men who are foolish and inconsiderate and lifted up, and who glory in the pride of their speech, than offend God. Let us reverence the Lord Jesus Christ, whose blood was given for us. Let us esteem those who have the rule over us. Let us honor the aged among us. Let us train up the young men in the fear of God. Let us direct our wives to that which is good. Let them exhibit the lovely habit of purity and all their conduct. Let them show forth the sincere disposition of meekness. Let them make manifest the command which they have of their tongue. By their manner of speaking, let them display their love, not by preferring one to another, but by showing equal affection to all that piously fear God. Let your children be partakers of true Christian training. Let them learn of how great a veil humility is with God. How much the spirit of pure affection can prevail with him. How excellent and great his fear is. And how it saves all those who walk in it with a pure mind. For he is a searcher of the thoughts and desires of the heart. His breath is in us. And when he pleases, he will take it away. End of chapter 21. Chapter 22. Now the faith which is in Christ confirms all these admonitions, for he himself by the Holy Ghost thus addresses us, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desires life and loves to see good days? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cried, and the Lord heard him, and delivered him out of all his troubles. Many are the stripes appointed for the wicked, but mercy shall compass those about who hope in the Lord. End of chapter 22. Chapter 23. The all-merciful and beneficent Father has bowels of compassion toward those who fear him, and kindly and lovingly bestows his favors upon those who come to him with a simple mind. So let us not be double-minded, neither let our soul be lifted up on account of his exceedingly great and glorious gifts. Far from us be that which is written, Wretched are they who are of a double mind, and of a doubting heart, who say, These things we have heard even in the times of our fathers, but behold, we have grown old, and none of them has happened to us. You foolish ones, compare yourselves to a tree. Take, for instance, the vine. First of all, it sheds its leaves, then it buds, 
next it puts forth leaves, and then it flowers, after that comes the sour grape, and then follows the ripened fruit. You perceive how in a little time the fruit of a tree comes to maturity. Of a truth, soon and suddenly shall his will be accomplished, as the scripture also bears witness, saying, Speedily will he come, and will not tarry, and the Lord shall suddenly come to his temple, even the Holy One for whom you look. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 Let us consider, beloved, how the Lord continually proves to us that there shall be a future resurrection, of which he has rendered the Lord Jesus Christ the first fruits by raising him from the dead. Let us contemplate, beloved, the resurrection which is at all times taking place. Day and night declare to us a resurrection. The night sinks to sleep, and the day arises. The day again departs, and the night comes on. Let us behold the fruits of the earth, how the sowing of grain takes place. The sower goes forth and casts it into the ground. And the seed being thus scattered, though dry and naked when it fell upon the earth, is gradually dissolved. Then out of its dissolution the mighty power of the providence of the Lord raises it up again. And from one seed many arise and bring forth fruit. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Let us consider that wonderful sign of the resurrection which takes place in eastern lands, that is, in Arabia and the countries round about. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix. This is the only one of its kind and lives five hundred years. And when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest of frankincense and myrrh and other spices, into which when the time is fulfilled, it enters and dies. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced, which being nourished by the juices of the dead bird, brings forth feathers. Then, when it has acquired strength, it takes up that nest in which are the bones of its parent, and bearing these it passes from the land of Arabia into Egypt, to the city called Heliopolis. And in open day, flying in the sight of all men, it places them on the altar of the sun. And having done this, hastens back to its former abode. The priests then inspect the registers of the dates, and find that it has returned exactly as the five hundredth year was completed. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Do we then deem it any great and wonderful thing for the Maker of all things to raise up again those who have piously served Him in the assurance of a good faith? when even by a bird he shows us the mightiness of his power to fulfill his promise. For the scripture says in a certain place, You shall raise me up, and I shall confess to you. And again, I laid down and slept, I awaked, because you are with me. And again, Job says, You shall raise up this flesh of mine, which has suffered all these things. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 Having then this hope, let our souls be bound to him who is faithful in his promises and just in his judgments. He who has commanded us not to lie shall much more himself not lie, for nothing is impossible with God except to lie. Let his faith therefore be stirred up again within us, and let us consider that all things are nigh unto him. By the word of his might he established all things, and by his word he can overthrow them. Who shall say to him, what have you done? Or who shall resist the power of his strength? When and as he pleases, he will do all things, and none of the things determined by him shall pass away. All things are open before him, and nothing can be hidden from his counsel. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day to day utter speech, and night to night shows knowledge, and there are no words or speeches of which the voices are not heard. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 Since then all things are seen and heard by God, let us fear him and forsake those wicked works which proceed from evil desires, so that through his mercy we may be protected from the judgments to come. For whither can any of us flee from his mighty hand? Or what world will receive any of those who run away from him? For the scripture says in a certain place, 
whither shall I go, and where shall I be hid from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I go away even to the uttermost parts of the earth, there is your right hand. If I make my bed in the abyss, there is your spirit. Whither then shall any one go, or where shall he escape from him who comprehends all things? End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 let us then draw near to him with holiness of spirit, lifting up pure and undefiled hands to him, loving our gracious and merciful Father, who has made us partakers in the blessings of his elect. For thus it is written, When the Most High divided the nations, when he scattered the sons of Adam, he fixed the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angels of God. His people Jacob became the portion of the Lord, and Israel the lot of his inheritance. And in another place the scripture says, Behold, the Lord takes to himself a nation out of the midst of the nations, as a man takes the first fruits of his threshing floor, and from that nation shall come forth the most holy. End of chapter 29. Chapter 30. Seeing therefore that we are the portion of the Holy One, let us do all those things which pertain to holiness, avoiding all evil speaking, all abominable and impure embraces, together with all drunkenness, seeking after change, all abominable lusts, detestable adultery, and execrable pride. For God, says the scripture, resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let us cleave then to those to whom grace has been given by God. Let us clothe ourselves with concord and humility, ever exercising self-control, standing far off from all whispering and evil speaking, being justified by our works, and not our words. For the scripture says, He that speaks much shall also hear much and answer. And does he that is ready in speech deem himself righteous? Blessed is he that is born of woman, who lives but a short time. Be not given to much speaking. Let our praise be in God, and not of ourselves. For God hates those who commend themselves. Let testimony to our good deeds be borne by others as it was in the case of our righteous forefathers. Boldness and arrogance and audacity belong to those that are accursed of God. But moderation, humility, and meekness to such as are blessed by him. Chapter 31 Let us cleave then to his blessing and consider what are the means of possessing it. Let us think over the things which have taken place from the beginning. For what reason was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because he wrought righteousness and truth through faith? Isaac, with perfect confidence, as if knowing what was to happen, cheerfully yielded himself as a sacrifice. Jacob, through reason of his brother, went forth with humility from his own land, and came to Laban and served him, and there was given to him the scepter of the twelve tribes of Israel. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 Whosoever will candidly consider each particular will recognize the greatness of the gifts which were given by him. For from him have sprung the priests and all the Levites who minister at the altar of God. From him also was descended our Lord Jesus Christ according to the flesh. From him arose kings, princes, and rulers of the race of Judah. Nor are his other tribes in small glory, inasmuch as God had promised, your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. All these therefore were highly honored and made great, not for their own sake, or for their own works, or for the righteousness which they wrought, but through the operation of his will. And we too, being called by his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified by ourselves, nor by our own wisdom, or understanding, or godliness, or works which we have wrought in holiness of heart but by that faith through which from the beginning Almighty God has justified all men, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of chapter 32. Chapter 33. What shall we do then, brethren? Shall we become slothful in well-doing and cease from the practice of love? God forbid that any such course should be followed by us, but rather let us hasten with all energy and readiness of mind to perform every good work. 
For the Creator and Lord of all himself rejoices in his works. For by his infinitely great power he established the heavens, and by his incomprehensible wisdom he adorned them. He also divided the earth from the water which surrounds it, and fixed it upon the immovable foundation of his own will. The animals also which are upon it he commanded by his own word unto existence. So likewise, when he had formed the sea, and the living creatures which are in it, he enclosed them within their proper bounds by his own power. Above all, with his holy and undefiled hands, he formed man, the most excellent of his creatures, and truly great through the understanding given him, the express likeness of his own image. For thus says God, Let us make man in our image, and after our likeness. So God made man, male and female, he created them. Having thus finished all these things, he approved them, and blessed them, and said, Increase, and multiply. We see, then, how all righteous men have been adorned with good works, and how the Lord himself, adorning himself with his works, rejoiced. Having therefore such an example, let us without delay accede to his will, and let us work the work of righteousness with our whole strength. End of chapter 33. Chapter 34. The good servant receives the bread of his labor with confidence. The lazy and slothful cannot look his employer in the face. It is requisite, therefore, that we be prompt in the practice of well-doing, for of him are all things. And thus he forewarns us, Behold, the Lord cometh, and his reward is before his face, to render to every man according to his work. He exhorts us, therefore, with our whole heart to attend to this, that we be not lazy or slothful in any good work. Let our boasting and our confidence be in him. Let us submit ourselves to his will. Let us consider the whole multitude of his angels, how they stand ever ready to minister to his will. For the scripture says, Ten thousand times ten thousand stood around him, and thousands of thousands ministered to him, and cried, Holy, 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 the Lord of Sabaoth, the whole creation is full of his glory. And let us therefore, conscientiously gathering together in harmony, cry to him earnestly, as with one mouth, that we may be made partakers of his great and glorious promises. For the scripture says, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which he has prepared for those who wait for him. End of chapter 34. Chapter 35. How blessed and wonderful, beloved, are the gifts of God! Life in immortality, splendor and righteousness, truth and perfect confidence, faith and assurance, self-control and holiness. And all these fall under the cognizance of our understandings now. What then shall those things be which are prepared for such as wait for him? The Creator and Father of all worlds, the Most Holy alone knows their amount and their beauty. Let us therefore earnestly strive to be found in the number of those who wait for Him, in order that we may share in His promised gifts. But how, beloved, shall this be done? If our understanding be fixed, by faith rewards God. If we earnestly seek the things which are pleasing and acceptable to him, if we do the things which are in harmony with his blameless will, and if we follow the way of truth, casting away from us all unrighteousness and iniquity, along with all covetousness, strife, evil practices, deceit, whispering, and evil speaking, all hatred of God, pride and haughtiness, vain glory and ambition, for they that do such things are hateful to God, and not only they that do them, but also those who take pleasure in those who do them. For the scripture says, But to the sinner God said, Why do you declare my statutes and take my covenant into your mouth, seeing you hate instruction, and cast my words behind you? When you saw a thief, you consented with him, and made your portion with adulterers. Your mouth has abounded with wickedness, and your tongue contrived deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silence. You thought, wicked one, that I should be like you. But I will reprove you, 
and set yourself before you. Consider now these things, you who forget God, lest he tear you in pieces like a lion, and there be none to deliver. The sacrifice of praise will glorify me, and a way is there by which I will show him the salvation of God. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 This is the way, beloved, in which we find our Savior, even Jesus Christ, the High Priest of all our offerings, the Defender and Helper of our infirmity. By Him we look up to the heights of heaven, by Him we behold, as in a glass, His immaculate and most excellent visage. By Him are the eyes of our hearts opened, by Him our foolish and darkened understanding blossoms up anew towards His marvelous light. By him the Lord has willed that we should taste of immortal knowledge, who, being the brightness of his majesty, is by so much greater than the angels, as he has, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. For it is thus written, Who makes his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? But concerning his son the Lord spoke thus, You are my son, today have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. And again he says to him, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. But who are his enemies? All the wicked, and those who set themselves to oppose the will of God. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Let us then, men and brethren, with all energy, act the part of soldiers in accordance with his holy commandments. Let us consider those who serve under our generals with what order, obedience, and submissiveness they perform the things which are commanded them. All are not prefects, nor commanders of a thousand, nor of a hundred, nor of fifty, nor the like, but each one in his own rank performs the things commanded by the king and the generals. The great cannot subsist without the small, nor the small without the great. There is a kind of mixture in all things, and thence arises mutual advantage. Let us take our body for an example. The head is nothing without the feet, and the feet are nothing without the head. Yea, the very smallest members of our body are necessary and useful to the whole body. But all work harmoniously together, and are under one common rule for the preservation of the whole body. End of chapter 37. Chapter 38. Let our whole body then be preserved in Christ Jesus, and let every one be subject to his neighbor according to the special gift bestowed upon him. Let the strong not despise the weak, and let the weak show respect to the strong. Let the rich man provide for the wants of the poor, and let the poor man bless God because he has given him one by whom his need may be supplied. Let the wise man display his wisdom, not by mere words, but through good deeds. Let the humble not bear testimony to himself, but leave witness to be borne to him by another. Let him that is pure in the flesh not grow proud of it, and boast, knowing that it was another who bestowed on him the gift of continence. Let us consider then, brethren, of what matter we were made, who and what manner of beings we came into the world, as it were, out of a sepulcher, and from utter darkness. He who made us and fashioned us, having prepared his bountiful gifts for us before we were born, introduced us into his world. Since therefore we receive all these things from him, we ought for everything to give him thanks, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of chapter 38 Chapter 39 Foolish and inconsiderate men, who have neither wisdom nor instruction, mock and deride us, being eager to exalt themselves in their own conceits. For what can a mortal man do? Or what strength is there in one made out of the dust? For it is written, There was no shape before mine eyes. Only I heard a sound and a voice saying, What then? Shall a man be pure before the Lord? Or shall such and one be counted blameless in his deeds, seeing he does not confide in his servants, and has charged even his angels with perversity. The heaven is not clean in his sight. How much less they that dwell in houses of clay, of which also we ourselves were made, 
he smote them as a moth, and from morning even until evening they endure not. Because they could furnish no assistance to themselves, they perished. He breathed upon them, and they died, because they had no wisdom. But call now, if any one will answer you, or if you will look to any of the holy angels. For wrath destroys the foolish man, and envy kills him that is in error. I have seen the foolish taking root, but their habitation was presently consumed. Let their sons be far from safety. Let them be despised before the gates of those less than themselves. And there shall be none to deliver. For what was prepared for them, the righteous shall eat. And they shall not be delivered from evil. End of chapter 39. Chapter 40. These things therefore being manifest to us, and since we look into the depths of the divine knowledge, it behooves us to do all things in their proper order, which the Lord has commanded us to perform at stated times. He has enjoined offerings to be presented, and service to be performed to him, and that not thoughtlessly or irregularly, but at the appointed times and hours. Where and by whom he desires these things to be done, he himself has fixed by his own supreme will, in order that all things being piously done according to his good pleasure, may be acceptable to him. Those, therefore, who present their offerings at the appointed times are accepted and blessed, for inasmuch as they follow the laws of the Lord, they sin not. For his own peculiar services are assigned to the high priest, and their own proper place is prescribed to the priests, and their own special ministrations devolve on the Levites. The layman is bound by the laws that pertain to laymen. Chapter 41 let every one of you, brethren, give thanks to God in his own order, living in all good conscience, with becoming gravity, and not going beyond the rule of the ministry prescribed to him. Not in every place, brethren, are the daily sacrifices offered, or the peace offerings, or the sin offerings, and the trespass offerings, but in Jerusalem only. And even there they are not offered in any place, but only at the altar before the temple, that which is offered being first carefully examined by the high priest and the ministers already mentioned. Those, therefore, who do anything beyond that which is agreeable to his will are punished with death. You see, brethren, that the greater the knowledge that has been vouchsafed to us, the greater also is the danger to which we are exposed. End of chapter 41. Chapter 42. The apostles have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has done so from God. Christ, therefore, was sent forth by God, and the apostles by Christ. Both these appointments, then, were made in an orderly way, according to the will of God. Having, therefore, received their orders, and being fully assured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and established in the word of God, with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand. And thus preaching through countries and cities, they appointed the first fruits of their labors, having first proved them by the Spirit, to be bishops and deacons of those who should afterwards believe. Nor was this any new thing, since indeed many ages before it was written concerning bishops and deacons. For thus says the scripture, A certain place. I will appoint their bishops in righteousness, and their deacons in faith. End of chapter 42. Chapter 43. And what wonder is it if those in Christ who were entrusted with such a duty by God appointed those ministers before mentioned, when the blessed Moses also, a faithful servant in all his house, noted down in the sacred books all the injunctions which were given him, and when the other prophets also followed him, bearing witness with one consent to the ordinances which he had appointed. For when rivalry arose concerning the priesthood, and the tribes were contending among themselves as to which of them should be adorned with that glorious title, he commanded the twelve princes of the tribes to bring him their rods, each one being inscribed with the name of the tribe. And he took them and bound them together, and sealed them with the rings of the princes of the tribes, and laid them up in the tabernacle of witness on the table of God. And having shut the doors of the tabernacle, he sealed the keys, as he had done the rods, and said to them, 
men and brethren, the tribe whose rod shall blossom has God chosen to fulfill the office of the priesthood and to minister to him. And when the morning was come, he assembled all Israel, six hundred thousand men, and showed the seals to the princes of the tribes, and opened the tabernacle of witness, and brought forth the rods. And the rod of Aaron was found not only to have blossomed, but to bear fruit upon it. What think you, beloved? Did not Moses know beforehand that this would happen? Undoubtedly he knew, but he acted thus that there might be no sedition in Israel, and that the name of the true and only God might be glorified, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 Our apostles also knew through our Lord Jesus Christ, and there would be strife on account of the office of the episcopate. For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned, and afterwards gave instructions that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. We are of opinion, therefore, that those appointed by them, or afterwards by other eminent men, with the consent of the whole church, and who have blamelessly served the flock of Christ in a humble, peaceable, and disinterested spirit, and have for a long time possessed the good opinion of all, cannot be justly dismissed from the ministry. For our sin will not be small if we eject from the episcopate those who have blamelessly and holily fulfilled its duties. Blessed are those presbyters who, having finished their course before now, have obtained a fruitful and perfect departure from this world. For they have no fear lest anyone deprive them of the place now appointed them. But we see that you have removed some men of excellent behavior from the ministry which they fulfilled blamelessly and with honor. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 Ye are fond of contention, brethren, and full of zeal about things which do not pertain to salvation. Look carefully into the scriptures, which are the true utterances of the Holy Spirit. Observe that nothing of any unjust or counterfeit character is written in them. There you will not find that the righteous were cast off by men who themselves were holy. The righteous were indeed persecuted, but only by the wicked. They were cast into prison, but only by the unholy. They were stoned, but only by transgressors. They were slain, but only by the accursed, and such as had conceived an unrighteous envy against them. Exposed to such sufferings, they endured them gloriously. For what shall we say, brethren? Was Daniel cast into the den of lions by such as feared God? Were Ananias and Azarias and Mishael shut up in a furnace of fire by those who observe the great and glorious worship of the Most High? Far from us be such a thought! Who then were they that did such things? The hateful, and those full of all wickedness, were roused to such a pitch of fury that they inflicted torture on those who served God with a holy and blameless purpose of heart not knowing that the Most High is the defender and protector of all such as with a pure conscience venerate his all-excellent name, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. But they who with confidence endured these things are now heirs of glory and honor, and have been exalted and made illustrious by God, and their memorial for ever and ever. Amen. End of chapter 45 Chapter 46 such examples, therefore, brethren, it is right that we should follow, since it is written, Cleave to the holy, for those who cleave to them shall themselves be made holy. And again in another place the scripture says, With a harmless man you shall prove thyself harmless, and with an elect man you shall be elect, and with a perverse man you shall show thyself perverse. Let us cleave, therefore, to the innocent and righteous, since these are the elect of God. Why are there strifes and tumults and divisions and schisms and wars among you? Have we not all one God and one Christ? Is there not one spirit of grace poured out upon us? And have we not one calling in Christ? Why do we divide and tear to pieces the members of Christ and raise up strife against our own body 
and have reached such a height of madness as to forget that we are members one of another. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, Woe to that man by whom offenses come. It were better for him that he had never been born than that he should cast a stumbling block before one of my elect. Yea, it were better for him that a millstone should be hung about his neck, and he should be sunk in the depths of the sea, than that he should cast a stumbling block before one of my little ones. Your schism has subverted the faith of many, has discouraged many, has given rise to doubt in many, and has caused grief to us all. And still your sedition continues. Of chapter 46. Chapter 47. Take up the epistle of the blessed apostle Paul. What did he write to you at the time when the gospel first began to be preached? Truly under the inspiration of the Spirit he wrote to you concerning himself and Cephas and Apollos, because even then parties had been formed among you. But that inclination for one above another entailed less guilt upon you, inasmuch as your partialities were then shown towards apostles, already of high reputation, and towards a man whom they had approved. But now reflect who those are that have perverted you, and lessened the renown of your far-famed brotherly love. It is disgraceful, beloved, yea, highly disgraceful, and unworthy of your Christian profession, that such a thing should be heard of, as that the most steadfast and ancient church of the Corinthians should, on account of one or two persons, engage in sedition against its presbyters. And this rumor has reached not only us, but those also who are unconnected with us, so that through your infatuation the name of the Lord is blasphemed while danger is also brought upon yourselves. End of chapter 47. Chapter 48. Let us therefore, with all haste, put an end to this state of things, and let us fall down before the Lord, and beseech him with tears, that he would mercifully be reconciled to us, and restore us to our former seemly and holy practice of brotherly love. For such conduct is the gate of righteousness, which is set open for the attainment of life, as it is written, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go in by them, and will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter in by it. Although therefore many gates have been set open, yet this gate of righteousness is that gate in Christ by which, blessed, are all they that have entered in, and have directed their way in holiness and righteousness, doing all things without disorder. Let a man be faithful, let him be powerful in the utterance of knowledge, let him be wise in judging of words, let him be pure in all his deeds. Yet the more he seems to be superior to others in these respects, the more humble-minded ought he to be, and to seek the common good of all, and not merely his own advantage. End of chapter 48 Chapter 49. Let him who has love in Christ keep the commandments of Christ. Who can describe the blessed bond of the love of God? What man is able to tell the excellence of its beauty as it ought to be told? The height to which love exalts is unspeakable. Love unites us to God. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love bears all things, is long-suffering in all things. There is nothing base, nothing arrogant in love. Love admits of no schisms, love gives rise to no seditions, love does all things in harmony. By love have all the elect of God been made perfect. Without love nothing is well-pleasing to God. In love has the Lord taken us to himself. On account of the love he bore us, Jesus Christ our Lord gave his blood for us by the will of God, his flesh for our flesh, and his soul for our souls. End of chapter 49. Chapter 50. Ye see, beloved, how great and wonderful a thing is love, and that there is no declaring its perfection. Who is fit to be found in it except such as God has vouchsafed to render so? Let us pray, therefore, and implore of his mercy that we may live blameless in love, free from all human partialities for one above another 
All the generations from Adam even to this day have passed away. But those who through the grace of God have been made perfect in love now possess a place among the godly, and shall be made manifest at the revelation of the kingdom of Christ. For it is written, Enter into thy secret chambers for a little time, until my wrath and fury pass away. And I will remember a propitious day, and will raise you up out of your graves. Blessed are we, beloved, if we keep the commandments of God in the harmony of love, that so through love our sins may be forgiven us. For it is written, Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not impute to him, and in whose mouth there is no guile. This blessedness comes upon those who have been chosen by God through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Chapter 51 Let us therefore implore forgiveness for all those transgressions which, through any suggestion of the adversary, we have committed. And those who have been the leaders of sedition and disagreement ought to have respect to the common hope. For such as live in fear and love would rather that they themselves than their neighbors should be involved in suffering. And they prefer to bear blame themselves rather than that the conquered which has been well and piously handed down to us should suffer. For it is better that a man should acknowledge his transgressions than that he should harden his heart as the hearts of those were hardened who stirred up sedition against Moses, the servant of God, and whose condemnation was made manifest to all. For they went down alive into Hades, and death swallowed them up, Pharaoh with his army, and all the princes of Egypt, and the chariots with their riders, were sunk in the depths of the Red Sea, and perished, for no other reason than that their foolish hearts were hardened, after so many signs and wonders had been wrought in the land of Egypt by Moses, the servant of God. End of chapter 51. Chapter 52. The Lord, brethren, stands in need of nothing, and he desires nothing of any one, except that confession be made to him. For says the elect David, I will confess to the Lord, and that will please him, more than a young bullock that has horns and hoofs. Let the poor see it, and be glad. And again he says, Offer to God the sacrifice of praise, and pay your vows to the Most High, and call upon me in the day of your trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. For the sacrifice of God is a broken spirit. End of chapter 52. Chapter 53. Ye understand, beloved, you understand well the sacred scriptures, and you have looked very earnestly into the oracles of God. Call then these things to your remembrance. When Moses went up into the mount and abode there with fasting and humiliation forty days and forty nights, the Lord said to him, Moses, Moses, get down quickly from here, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have committed iniquity. They have quickly departed from the way in which I commanded them to walk, and have made to themselves molten images. And the Lord said to him, I have spoken to you once and again, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make you a great and wonderful nation, and one much more numerous than this. But Moses said, Far be it from you, Lord. Pardon the sin of this people, else blot me also out of the book of the living. O oh, marvelous love! O oh, insuperable perfection! The servant speaks freely to his Lord and asks forgiveness for the people or begs that he himself might perish along with them. End of chapter 53. Chapter 54. Who then among you is noble-minded, who compassionate, who full of love? Let him declare, if on my account sedition and disagreement and schisms have arisen, I will depart. I will go away whithersoever you desire, and I will do whatever the majority commands. Only let the flock of Christ live on terms of peace with the presbyters set over it. He that acts thus shall procure to himself great glory in the Lord, and every place will welcome him. For 
the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. These things they who live a godly life that is never to be repented of, both have done and always will do. End of chapter 54. Chapter 55. To bring forward some examples from among the heathen, many kings and princes in times of pestilence, when they had been instructed by an oracle, have given themselves up to death, in order that by their own blood they might deliver their fellow citizens from destruction. Many have gone forth from their own cities, that so sedition might be brought to an end within them. We know many among ourselves, who have given themselves up to bonds, in order that they might ransom others. Many too have surrendered themselves to slavery, that with the price which they receive for themselves, they might provide food for others. Many women also, being strengthened by the grace of God, have performed numerous manly exploits. The blessed Judith, when her city was besieged, asked of the elders permission to go forth into the camp of the strangers, and exposing herself to danger, she went out for the love which she bare to her country, and people then besieged. And the Lord delivered Holofernes into the hands of a woman. Esther, also being perfect in faith, exposed herself to no less danger, in order to deliver the twelve tribes of Israel from impending destruction. For with fasting and humiliation she entreated the everlasting God, who sees all things, and he, perceiving the humility of her spirit, delivered the people for whose sake she had encountered peril. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 Let us then also pray for those who have fallen into any sin, that meekness and humility may be given to them, so that they may submit, not to us, but to the will of God. For in this way they shall secure a fruitful and perfect remembrance from us, with sympathy for them, both in our prayers to God and our mention of them to the saints. Let us receive correction, beloved, on account of which no one should feel displeased. Those exhortations by which we admonish one another are both good in themselves, and highly profitable, for they tend to unite us to the will of God. For thus says the Holy Word, The Lord has severely chastened me, yet has not given me over to death. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. The righteous, it says, shall chasten me in mercy, and reprove me. But let not the oil of sinners make fat my head. And again he says, Blessed is the man whom the Lord reproves, and reject not the warning of the Almighty. For he causes sorrow, and again restores to gladness. He wounds, and his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles, yea, in the seventh no evil shall touch you. In famine he shall rescue you from death and in war he shall free you from the power of the sword. From the scourge of the tongue will he hide you, and you shall not fear when evil comes. You shall hew at the unrighteous and the wicked, and shall not be afraid of the beasts of the field. For the wild beasts shall be at peace with you. Then shall you know that your house shall be in peace, and the habitation of your tabernacle shall not fail. You shall know also that your seed shall be great, and your children like the grass of the field. And you shall come to the grave like ripened corn, which is reaped in its season, or like a heap of the threshing floor which is gathered together at the proper time. You see, beloved, that protection is afforded to those who are chastened of the Lord. For since God is good, he corrects us that we may be admonished by his holy chastisement. End of chapter 56 Chapter 57 Ye therefore, who laid the foundation of this sedition, submit yourselves to the presbyters, and receive correction, so as to repent, bending the knees of your hearts. Learn to be subject, laying aside the proud and arrogant self-confidence of your tongue. For it is better for you that you should occupy a humble but honorable place in the flock of Christ, than that, being highly exalted, you should be cast out from the hope of his people. For thus speaks all virtuous wisdom. Behold, I will bring forth to you the words of my spirit, and I will teach you my speech. Since I called and you did not hear, I held forth my words and you regarded not, but said it not my counsels, and yielded not at my reproofs. 
Therefore I too will laugh at your destruction. Yea, I will rejoice when ruin comes upon you, and when sudden confusion overtakes you, when overturning presents itself like a tempest, or when tribulation and oppression fall upon you. For it shall come to pass that when you call upon me, I will not hear you. The wicked shall seek me, and they shall not find me. For they hated wisdom, and did not choose the fear of the Lord, nor would they listen to my counsels, but despised my reproofs. So they shall eat the fruits of their own way, and they shall be filled with their own ungodliness. End of chapter 57 Chapter 58 May God, who sees all things, and who is the ruler of all spirits, and the Lord of all flesh, who chose our Lord Jesus Christ, and us through him to be a peculiar people, grant to every soul that calls upon his glorious and holy name, faith, fear, peace, patience, long-suffering, self-control, purity, and sobriety, to the well-pleasing of his name, through our High Priest and Protector, Jesus Christ, by whom be to him glory and majesty and power and honor, both now and forevermore. Amen. End of chapter 58. Chapter 59. Send back speedily to us, in peace and with joy, these are messengers to you, Claudius Ephibus and Valerius Beto, with Fortunatus, that they may the sooner announce to us the peace and harmony we so earnestly desire and long for among you, and that we may the more quickly rejoice over the good order reestablished among you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and with all everywhere that are the called of God, through him, by whom be to him glory, honor, power, majesty, and eternal dominion, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.